Welcome back to You Have Permission, the show that aims to take both Christianity and the modern world of science and culture very seriously. I'm Dan Koch. I'm a licensed therapist. And uh, what have I been saying? I'm a post-evangelical liberal Protestant. And you know what I'm trying to do, Tony? What's I'm that? just trying to tame the wild place that is my facial hair at the moment. <laughs> I hope God is there in that wild place. With me today, Tony Jones, author, theologian, co-host of the Generation Gap Culture Hour episodes, um, which co-host. regular listeners will know. I mean, whatever. Co-host. You guys are, I guess I regular, host regular a Regular guest, contributor, maybe. Regular but... con- contributing, <laughs> contributing member. I know. I'll take the upgrade. <laughs> okay, regular. I mean, you're if you're in every single one, I don't think that's I'll a take, regular I'll, I'll contributor. I'll take the promotion for sure. <laughs> I think the three of us kind of, with Josh, we sort of co-host that. Anyway, we are here uh, to talk about your book. I mean, we talk about all kinds of stuff, you know, every month or two. And, you know, you've mentioned that you've been writing this book, that it's been coming out. There's been some funny stories about reviews of the book and people's reactions to the book and some inside baseball, which I always appreciate around publisher decisions and all that kind of thing. But now we are finally here to talk about the book itself, the content of the book, The God of Wild Places, which comes out uh, tomorrow as of this Released Tuesday, April second. This is going to come out Monday the first, and I'm excited. I'm I'm I'm, ha- I'm happy the day's here. Congratulations, Tony. Thanks. It's uh, it's been a long time coming, and it took me ten years to write my shortest book. Of all my books, I think that, that yeah, it's like 150 my... pages. <laughs> Very yes, digestible. It's... No, I've talked to people who've read the whole thing in a day. Yeah. 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 I want to say what I like about it before we kind of get into our conversation. Actually, I realized this morning while I was driving my son to preschool that it's like the new Netflix show, The Three Body Problem, mm-hmm. uh, which I was watching the the first episode last night with Jaffrey. And at one point I said to her, there's a section that takes place in the Cultural Revolution of China in the 60s. So when Mao and and the Communist Party are taking over the government and culture of that nation. And I was like, it's so cool to have part of this story be set in a time and place that I know happened, but I know nothing about it. In fact, probably the only thing I really know about is Tiananmen Square, which I think is in the 80s. That happens much later. So I know very little about what went on in Red Square. I've been to Red Square in Beijing. I've been to the palace. I've seen the big uh, Mao portrait there. It's a window into a world I don't know about but through a format that I do know about, which is like science fiction television shows or filmed storytelling. And I think that there's something similar going on with the God of Wild Places. I don't really know about hunting. I don't know about sort of extended times in nature. I I, I love a good hike. I love to be in nature. I love to look at the beauty of nature, but I don't, I don't know that world. And yet, I know that the form of a faith or theological memoir. And so it's a, it's a nice kind of combination of a form I'm familiar with, a type of book I like to read, but set in a in quite a different space than all my fellow bespectacled nerd bros who, you know, we just talk about Julian of Norwich and Terrence Malick films. So it's it's refreshing in that sense. That's kind of you to say, for sure, that's a challenge. That, that's a, that was a writing challenge for me. Hmm. I mean, it, it's a marketing challenge of like, what do you put on the cover? Do you put Tony holding a gun on the cover? Probably not, even though there's right. a lot of hunting stories in it. You know, people have told me that the most affecting chapter is the chapter on butchering meat. Do you put Tony butchering meat on the cover? No, you don't do that because what you want you know, is as many people as possible to give it a chance. So you put yeah. Tony and a dog in a canoe on the cover. and <laughs> You imagine, uh, what's the Calvin and Hobbes cover of this book? <laughs> but right. let's not animate it. <laughs> <laughs> well, we actually, Dan, I mean, there was a whole period of time where the cover was going to be that image or a similar image, but it was going to mm-hmm. be kind of in that retro national park poster type vibe. Oh, yeah, yeah. That that artwork style, yeah. Which almost has like, almost like a, a Russian uh, propaganda Yeah, a little bit of that vibe. Art Deco thing because yes. of the time. Yeah. So there were there were whole mock-up covers that look like that, and I'm yeah. so glad we didn't do that because 
it's just so hard to communicate what's inside of a book in a title and a subtitle mm-hmm. and a cover image. It's just really, really hard, and it's it's not a science, man. It's like educated guesses, and it's editors and marketing people and my agent and me and some of my friends. You know, I think if a memoir succeeds, it's that people can find themselves in the story even if they didn't experience it. Right. That's what makes a good memoir. And I've read so, and I don't know if mine does that or not, of course. I tried to do that, but it's why you can read Mary Carr and think, well, I didn't grow up in a crazy alcoholic family in West Texas with a mentally ill and alcoholic mom. But she's such a good writer. You're like, you find threads yeah. within, you yeah. know. Um, you find points of connection for yourself. You as can a read a Kathleen Norris book and be like, I've never been in North Dakota and I've never been a postulant middle aged woman. And yet, my God, inc- I love it. You know, I, I'm, I'm sitting next to Kathleen Norris in a monastery in North Dakota. Right. That's, of course, what any memoirist is, is aiming for is that somebody who doesn't share those same life experiences can read it and be like, yeah there's things in there that resonate with me enough that I'm going to tell other people, you should try this book, even if you're not a hunter. Yeah. And I guess I just would say by way of recommendation, and then we'll kind of get into our chat. If people have been interested at all in what you've talked about sort of throughout the various episodes, you know, a a lot of our generation gap culture hour, the first half is on the main feed. So even non-patrons will have heard you talk about this stuff some, or if you find today's conversation Interesting. I I just would highly recommend reading or listening to the book. It's well written. It's like you said, it's short, it's digestible. I think it's like a kind of a breath of fresh air uh, compared to other books in this genre simply because, yeah, it is taking it's it's like taking us back to the Cultural Revolution. It's, It's just a it's a valuable and unique addition to the literature by, I think, successfully weaving these things together. And, and so I want to give you props for that. Thanks. I appreciate you saying that. I mean, if if you mean in the genre of literature of like deconstruction, I remember in the emerging church movement, there was, you know, all of a sudden the floodgates opened and there were all these books about yeah. people who were rethinking church and how you would rethink preaching and how you would rethink prayer. And I, I mean, I wrote some of them. Then you got kind of a spate of memoirs of people some of whom were quite famous, but like Shauna Nequist, Rachel Held Evans, people who were raised in the church and were not forsaking their faith by any means, but were rethinking right. it. And it'll be interesting what the next wave of books in that deconstruction camp will be. The kind of people who listen to your podcast, some of them are probably writing memoirs, you know. Mm-hmm. My guess is that, at least for my audience, what people are going to want to hear is a rebuilding of sorts, like a positive construction of something afterward, which is which is one of the things that, that your book offers and that we're going to talk about. Let me give sort of a, here's, we got a sort of three-part, three-act structure, bringing back in uh, TV and movies here. So act one, we want to talk about your early life into ministry, which starts for you in junior high. Uh, And your youth ministry work, I I forgot to describe you earlier as Tony Jones, author, theologian, and recovering youth ministry wonderkind. Um, (laughs) You know, you can't can't get it all. And then emergent movement and becoming a theologian, going back, getting the PhD. That might be the shortest part, just to sort of set things up here. Then act two, your marriage is crumbling, and you start going into nature to sort of deal with that. And then that starts to change you. And maybe that's kind of the bulk of the conversation, but we, we're going to return to the world of theology, God, et cetera. And basically re how you have reinterpreted that first act in light of the second act. And what does it say to you about God, religion, spirituality, all that stuff. So we're going to, we're going to do our best there to start. And let's just start with those, those early days. So Tell us how you felt initially called to be a minister and a pastor. I grew up in a family that was, I'd say, like, education was the top value in my Mm -hmm. family, and religious faith was second, which is probably different than a lot of people who grew up evangelical. I didn't. My parents were 
evangelical adjacent. I mean, the, the church we grew up in, that my brothers and I grew up in, that my parents took us to, my grandparents had founded it. Like we had an evangelical youth pastor who had worked for Young Life, you know, but our senior pastor had gone to Harvard and then went to Union Seminary. So it, although my church liberal. didn't join... Yeah. Yes, okay, liberal, but it was a little different in the 70s and 80s. Like, yeah, he had a bust of... JFK on his desk, a bust, like a bronze bust of JFK, but he was staunchly pro-life and preached about it. And on Pentecost Sunday, every year he spoke in tongues. So it was not a church you could easily categorize. Yeah. It was, you know, it was an odd mix, but it was very kind of centrist it was not it was not political back in those days churches could could be non-political you know the whole rest of my life is going to be spent feeling nostalgia for mid-century american protestantism that i never experienced <laughs> yes and that's okay dan and that's what i grew up in i mean just to tell yeah. you a funny like how how i didn't understand conservative and liberal when i went to college and i got involved in campus crusade for christ everybody was reading the frank peretti novels and I yeah. read this present darkness, and I don't know if you remember, but Satan and the demons lived in a big steeple downtown church with like that had red carpeting down the center yeah. aisle and bre- yeah, and brass door no- knobs, and I'm like, that's my church, yeah. And 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 the, and the angels got their gas in their tanks from the little Bible church that was outside of town. Remember the faithful remnant with no social power. <laughs> Yeah. And I was oblivious wow. to that, that we were liberals, because we weren't liberals. I mean, right. the guy preached pro-life sermons. You know what I mean? I mean, yeah. a quarter of a quarter, I think one quarter, approaching one half of our annual church budget went to international mission work, you know, building yeah. wells, but also evangelism. So to your point, it's hard to even remember what church life was like in the 80s when I was in right. middle school and high school. Hard to even remember. But I went to a big, fun church, big youth group, you know, with a rock band and 150 kids on Sunday night. Um, we'd sing Jackson Brown songs and we'd sing kind of young lifey songs. This was before any of the really Maranatha or any any of the kind of stuff people no date. Chris Tomlin was probably in, you know, in, in diapers when we when I was in youth group. Um <laughs> but to the point of the book, I was tapped early for leadership. And I would say I wasn't a super confident kid in, I mean, I was good at school and everything, but I, that's not where I really sp- spread my wings or felt my chest puff up. But at church, for sure, at church, it was, I was put in leadership positions right away. I was, I, I say this in the book and you, cause, and I know I'm saying this cause you'll appreciate this, but when I was in ninth grade, I was what was called, we, you know, instead of junior counselor, we called them junior commandos. I was a junior commando in ninth grade. Oh JC. God. I know, JC. JC. <laughs> and one of the things I did was I taught Sunday school for sixth grade boys with this other guy named Gary Giltner, who was like at my dad's age. Okay. Mm-hmm. So they would pair up a not, like a freshman in high school with a dad. And we were teaching Preparing for Adolescence by James Dobson. Oh. Big eye roll for those of you who are just listening. Yeah. Dan just gave the big. His eyes may never come back into his head after maybe, that. Maybe eye roll. just maybe just go to YouTube and go find the YouTube version. <laughs> go to about the fifteen minute mark, and you'll get that. You'll you'll that see the eye, eye roll, roll. The Dan Coke eye roll. It's so, more than I. It was it was actually a shudder of disgust passed through my whole body. So I want you to think about this, Dan. I'm fifteen and I'm teaching six sixth grade boys about yeah. the sin of masturbation. <laughs> well, it, what it reminds me of is when I was in Campus Crusade for Christ and our Bible study leader, when I was a freshman, our Bible study leader was a sophomore. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and like, I, there oh. was also a guy who was like, I don't know, maybe six or seven years older than him. It wasn't like there was no like real adult there. N- that guy, Chris Brosomley, is now a friend of mine. Like we, uh-huh. our friendship survived that kind of awkward <laughs> forced mentoring or whatever. Yeah. But yeah. it was even a bit then. It was like, wait, how how much more about the world do you know than, than us? You've been here right. at this undergraduate institution for one additional year. 
Yeah, and like I'm a 15 year old and I'm telling sixth graders not to masturbate, right. and they yeah, probably haven't olds. even ever thought of it before, and that yeah. it's all I think about. You know, <laughs> like it's so <laughs> stupid, it's so stupid. But my church saw leadership potential in me and fostered that in me, hmm. um, so that you know, by the time I went to college, I was seminary bound for sure, and I had some bumps along the road, mainly because of Campus Crusade. But I did, you know, immediately go to seminary after college. I went to Fuller in California and did that in three years and then spent the next 10 years doing ministry work, uh, a lot of youth ministry, in which that's when I became, in, as Mike Iaconelli told me one time about my first book, which is called Postmodern Youth Ministry, he said, I think it's generally considered to be a minor classic in youth ministry. <laughs> A minor like, classic. Wow. A minor classic. Put that I on mean, your gravestone. <laughs> Tony Jones. You wrote a minor classic. And a minor classic in youth, in youth, ministry, youth ministry circles. Which has got to be one of the nichiest <laughs> sub genres in all of publishing, you know. Uh huh. And not even a full classic. So even no. those people, some of them, it, you know no. what it is? It's the Sherwood of youth ministry writing. There you go. It's like, oh, I think I. I think I remember that band I think name. I, I know I a song by them. those guys. I might have heard a song. Maybe on I saw them on the front page of MySpace at one point. I think minor, that, I think I classic. saw them open for an opening band for a band <laughs> yeah, exactly. I really wanted to see. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So we we <laughs> yeah. share that. Yeah. That was the deal. And then yeah, I did go and get a PhD from Princeton. That took a long time. I was writing books. The emerging church movement was blowing up. You know, yep. I was on top of the world. All that ended, you use what metaphor you want, the rug came out from under me, my mm-hmm. legs got knocked up. In, in the book, I use the metaphor of, it's like when you're a, um, you know, a landlubber like me and you take a, a vacation to the beach and you go and you wade in to the ocean and then you get hit by a wave when you're like knee deep, you're like, dang, and then kind of like the first wave, divorce, kind of knocked me to my knees and then another wave custody fight and online craziness yeah really like dishwashered me in between 2009 and 2015 and and I kind of came to at the end of 2015 I had my kids but I had my career was gone and I wasn't really a pastor anymore book deals teaching gigs everything was gone so then I started going outside yeah so that kind of sends you out into nature and, you know, you, you describe it as like initially to find some sense of control, some, you know, during a, an uncontrol, a time feeling a, very out of control, right? A little bit of solace. But what do you end up finding instead? Like what, what surprises you about that next season of life? I had not grown up hunting and my dad didn't hunt. My grandfathers didn't hunt. It wasn't something I was super familiar with. Mm -hmm. I had dabbled in it a little bit. People had invited me before. It's pretty common in Minnesota, you know, that people hunt. I mean, it's not uncommon. I I bet on my street, on my block, there's, I know of one other guy who hunts. So it's not like out of, I don't know, 20 homes. It's not like everybody does it, but it's not like weird to do it. But what I guess was surprising or I didn't see coming was how much I loved it. You know, it was just a weird thing to be like, I'm this guy who preaches peace all the time because that's the gospel message. Like Jesus came to bring peace between us and God. It's all about peace. And then I'm going out and finding this great comfort and enjoyment in a pretty brutal activity, like killing other animals, butchering them, uh, eating them, you know, so... That I did not see that coming. That was not something I'm like, well, my life fell apart. Maybe I'll try hunting. It was like I just was drawn to it. I, I bet the, the kind of guy who would think that would actually maybe be a slightly worrisome kind of guy, it, you know, from my perspective of like, <laughs> yeah. you know, what? It, that's kind of like the, oh, my my partner left me. I'm just going to go sleep around as much as I can. Like, <laughs> right. you know, you know, it will bring me some control fucking killing organisms, you know, like that would be a, maybe a slight red flag if that's how if that's yeah. how yeah. you had gone in and it's not what you were aiming for. I can really relate to the idea of 
finding God, finding spirituality in nature, just generally speaking, on a hike, on a canoe trip, on a camping trip, you know, in a, even staying at a cabin, you know, that's, that's sort of less connected to the city and kind of more connected to the natural world or finding, finding it in your backyard. There's a real difference between that and hunting, right? Like the, those are distinct. And I, I kind of want you to help me understand the difference between the two, because one is familiar to me and the other is not familiar. First of all, I'd just say that anybody, I'd say kind of two prefatory or prolegomena statements. And one is, I of course would not disparage anybody who finds connection to the divine in any kind of uh, outdoor activity, even if it's a lot more peaceful than what I do. That's the first thing I'd say. And then the second thing is just that even in the book, there's a lot of times when I don't have a gun in my hand, like when I'm out canoeing, like the cover image, you know, that that's a lot of my outdoor life. It's not like I'm always right. hunting. Um, <laughs> AB, you're not ABH. You're not always be hunting. Always be hunting. And it's not really a book about hunting. You know, it's, it was, it's funny when you're in, you, you know, you, I know you have some interest in like the inner workings of, of the publishing world. And we, you and I were actually texting about this a couple days ago, but the publisher gets to submit three BISAC codes. That's inner language for like, if, if you're, if you're diagnosing somebody out of the DSM or whatever, you know, you yeah. can give them like whatever, one, whatever, one or two or three diagnoses. Well, we can in the publishing world, give three BISAC codes when we submit it to the library of Congress and Amazon. Okay, except that, except that I'm not like, okay, so I've just diagnosed you. Um, with uh, bipolar two, and you know I got two open slots here, so let's see <laughs> <laughs> what best fits. You're like, there's In so that many, sense, but no, it's a little different. Dan, think if you were with a client and you're like, I could diagnose this person with ten disorders. I got to pick three just for the insurance come, you know, this kind of thing. And I remember having these conversations like during my divorce, or like when I take my kids to therapy their therapist would be like, well, for you to submit it to insurance, I need to code them, you know, with something. Yes, you, you do have to have, for insurance, you have to have a code. Um, this is what no, I'm saying. I, I, so point is same. taken. I just think it's funny, the idea that like, <laughs> well, what are you gonna, what are we going to put in the other slots? <laughs> so we had to pick three and it's like yeah. not, hunting was not one of them. But um, of course, Amazon, I'm sure AI just like on Kindle, reads the book and comes yeah. up with a category. And one of the categories for Kindle is sport hunting, you know? Meanwhile, yeah. one of the categories on the hardcover at currently while we're recording this for, for on Amazon is Christian living, which that's probably come up with because, oh, well, that's what this guy writes about. That's his, like his past books have been like about that. Sure. And that's a, and that's a part of whatever sort of algorithm they're using to sort of maximize readers. Yeah. But on the sport hunting front, I just would like to read a quote from The God of Wild Places by Tony Jones. I don't call hunting or fishing a sport. <laughs> <laughs> just Thus, literally don't call it a sport. Amazon.com. Number one new release in sport hunting. Cool. Yeah. So the, the algorithm, go, you, the AI missed that part. The AI least. missed that phrase in the book. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I take it that there was quite a bit of surprise. Uh, you you did not have the experiences out hunting that you expected to have. At me, at least not with regard to God and spirituality. What was the first thing you noticed on one of those trips that you were like, oh, this is. There's stuff going on at a level or register that I was not anticipating as I said yes to this hunting invitation because I had some days off or whatever. There's one hunting trip I write about that took place when I was about 30. And I didn't really start hunting till I was 40, but I did get invited to go hunting with a parishioner at the church when I was about 30. And we ended up way deep in Canada before... I mean, he had no GPS. We did not have cell phones. I think he had a bag phone back in the cabin, you know, in, in, that was hooked up to a car battery. Wow. It was like, this This is, you know, this is 1999 or something. And we got caught in a storm, and it was very frightening. And it could have, I mean, it easily could have turned into one of those stories of like two hunters, uh, bodies 
found yeah. six months after they disappeared. Like that's right. how far really we were in the middle of nowhere with nobody knowing where we were. Uh, we made it home, obviously, but I, I have a very vivid memory that night of experiencing a great deal of peace as we were going in this little duck boat through this storm, like bouncing, bouncing over waves. If, if anybody, probably a lot of people who are listening have been in some kind of a small fishing boat, like an Alumacraft, maybe a 14-foot little Alumacraft yeah. with an outboard motor. And when you plap, you slap, slap. Yeah, it's and very like loud. That, yeah. that kind of thing, like the whole thing vibrates under you. And, and I'm just hanging on, boom, boom. And there's water, you know, splashing on me in the fog. We can't even... We can't see 10 feet in the fog, and we're hitting rocks. I mean, it was really frightening. And the oxymoronic part of that night is that I felt a great deal of peace. And what made it extra oxymoronic is that I had no peace back at home. So here I am in this literal Mm. storm feeling peace, and back at home I'm in this very stormy marriage where I cannot find peace as although I'm doing everything in my power to try to make make it happen, you know, make it look at least to the outside world like, oh, this young pa- rising pastor has his shit all together, you know, even though I didn't. But I hit it pretty well like people who are married to alcoholics do that. They they try to bring order to the chaos or at least mm-hmm. have an exterior veneer of order. Right. And I was doing that, but I, I felt so much inner turmoil. And meanwhile, and then you add the extra layer theologically of, oh, I'm a sellout to this gospel of peace. Like Jesus brings peace. And and I'm preaching that. And I'm teaching the youth group about that, but I'm not a I don't have any peace. I have no peace. Hmm. You know? I'm not gonna ask you to compare yourself to Jesus sleeping in the boat in the story. <laughs> When they're out fishing, which is hunting, right? Of course, a form of hunting. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, because I don't want to. I don't want to tempt you with that. I just. I noticed there's some very interesting thematic stuff there uh, that one could possibly draw. What I would rather ask you about is, I like thinking about that raw experience, and I think that from an experiential level, something that religious and spiritual human beings have always found to be a sort of marker of truth or depth or, ah, okay, this is, I'll keep going this direction, is that peace or sometimes joy. I would say those are kind of the two that come up the most in the biblical witness. And I've experienced each of those. Probably for me, it's actually more often been joy, like a kind of a breaking in of like just sort of intense joy and happiness. Uh, but there is a, there's a piece to that. And so I, I kind of want to ask about that. So if, if we're asking what was the first thing you noticed and we're trying to sort of apply this to someone who's going through changes, discerning what to do next, you're out there and you're like, this is not a place I should be feeling peace. That's a sign. That's like a, a clue is kind of yeah. how I would talk about it with a client. And I just want to, I kind of want to see what you would say to that. You know, I don't know that at the time, I think some of this is retrospective reflection sure. on, on this. And it's yeah. part of, you know, writing a memoir. And I have this quote in, at the end in the acknowledgments of, you know, Mary Carr, one of the great memoirists of our world says you shouldn't write about anything that's less than eight years old. <laughs> and I started writing this memoir when everything was much more fresh and raw. It took me a long time to get my way to get enough distance from it. So the point being, all I knew, all I knew at the time was I cannot wait to get back out into that duck boat. I cannot yeah. wait. Like when can I do this again? How can it, you know, it got, it got to be the point then years later where I'm like, how can I organize my entire life around these experiences so I can be outside hunting as much as possible? How can I not have a normal nine to five job? You know, how can I figure right. out how to, how to afford to go to the, on these hunting trips, even though I don't have a lot of money or whatever. But at the time, I think if you would have asked me, I probably would have said, oh, yeah, it was incredible. I felt Because I remember being able to say, like, this night we got caught in this storm, and but I felt this peace in spite of being caught in this storm. Mm-hmm. Because at the time, Dan, I wasn't honest enough with myself about how much inner turmoil I had. Like, 
Why mm. was that moment so poignant and powerful for me? Well, of course it was because the rest of my life was a cluster, right. you know? Yeah, but that wasn't clear at the time. That's just clear. No, with, I couldn't. Well, I couldn't admit it. I couldn't admit mm. it. That's for sure. You know, because I was still in this like posture of, oh, no, I've got my shit together. Yeah, still trying to be, you know, an authority, still trying to be like a big name in that world and and sort of keep all that momentum And just be going. a pastor. Just be sure. a pastor at a big church. You can't, you know, I'm 30 years old. I'm like the first kid's on the way. I just bought a house, but let me tell you, my marriage is shit. No, nobody's going to, like, you don't right. say that. You don't even yeah. admit that to yourself because you know the whole house of cards could fall. You know? Right. Let's skip ahead 10 years. So you actually really start hunting around 40. So we're yeah. talking 10, 12 years ago now. You know, I got divorced. The divorce took like a year and a half, 08 and 09. And then I kind of, you know, got foreclosed on and everything. I started I was literally scratch. just going to make a distasteful joke about how your marriage matched the housing and, e and a housing market and economy of the United oh. States. And then you did it for me. Look, Dan, I'll tell you two stories. That's that kind a book, of, by the way. I'll tell you, I'll tell you two stories that bookend this period of my life yeah. is that I got my biggest ever book advance in 2005 for my book called The New Christians from Josie Bass. I think it was 50 mm -hmm. grand. And I mean, I bought I bought a house, a mm -hmm. house and I, I had a like a $3500 a month mortgage cuz I'm like, "Oh, look, I'm just going up from here." Right? I mean, I'm like 35 I'm getting a PhD from Princeton. I just got a 50K book advance. I'm getting speaking gigs all over the world. Like, I'll be able to make this mortgage, these mortgage payments. And then, like, I, then I file for divorce in 08. Of course, we get foreclosed on. We're totally underwater on the house, right. you know? Yeah. And then jump ahead, I kind of start rebuilding my life. And then in 2015, I mean, the, the interesting thing is, like, you, you and I are recording this during Holy Week, and my last book which was called Did God Kill Jesus, came out Holy Week of 2015. I was scheduled to preach on Palm Sunday at Mars Hill Church in Grand Rapids, Michigan, one of Rob the most high-profile... Rob yeah. Bell's church, the most high pro, one of the most high-profile churches in the country. I was going to preach Palm Sunday and then fly to New York where I was going to do a, a whole week of media during Holy Week between Palm Sunday and Good Friday, including debate Bill O'Reilly on the O'Reilly factor because he had a book out called Killing Jesus. Right. And in 48 hours of the week before, so the week before Holy Week, it all I lost it all because stuff was posted about me online. Hmm. Kent Dobson called me from Mars Hill Church in tears saying, we're rescinding your preaching gig. I ended up flying to New York, sitting in a hotel room for a week. I got Morning Joe. <laughs> On, and they and they recorded it and didn't air it for three months or something like that. That was the like one media hit I got, and yeah. the book flopped. In fact, I was texting with my editor for that book yesterday because he's been super supportive of me all all through. But so that's just I, I kind of like had this first little hurdle and then kind of didn't quite fall. That those were the two ocean waves hitting me. Well, you know, it wasn't all bad, Tony, because that's when I first heard you talking to Trip Fuller on Homebrewed Christianity about that book. <laughs> yeah, well, Trip, yeah. God bless that guy. I mean, he, yeah. he's, is that some, you know how it is. I mean, some friends mm -hmm. totally stuck with me. A lot didn't, but yeah. uh, some did. So, and here, I guess to your question of what is it about the outdoors, Dan, is that for me, or the like the aspect of hunting and fishing or, you know, the more rigorous aspects of going outdoors, not just like taking a walk in the woods or being in my backyard and seeing the butterflies in our, you know, pollinator garden, but like being wet and dirty and hungry and, and even having a firearm in my hand and shooting Yeah, you're really starting to then, lose me here, but I'll follow you. I'm going to keep going. Yeah, well, that was <laughs> my, my, my point is like my real life was really freaking messy broken, even you might say, quote unquote, violent at times. I mean, there was, there wasn't actual physical violence, but it felt like inside of me, there was an inner violence, inner turmoil. I had a lot of anger and going outside was like, oh, that's what, that's what the wilderness is like. 
Like there's violence out here. Animals are dying. They're fighting for survival. They're eating each other. Yeah, constantly. Tree, yeah. You know, trees are falling over in the in the in the woods every time there's a windstorm. And you yeah. know, you you're taking a hike in the woods and you see the rib cage of a deer that's been taken down by a pack of coyotes the last winter, and those those ribs are picked clean, yeah. right? And and you see the spinal column of a dead deer, and you're like, yeah, that's this is actually to me. I'm like, oh, this is the real world. Church isn't the real world. Church church is a place of you know in the Presbyterian book of worship it says uh, worship should be done decently and in order, and I'm like. <laughs> Life is not decent and it's not orderly. Life is a freaking mess. It's it's painful and it's a struggle. And so I just felt not only more drawn to the outdoors, but I also felt drawn to more like theological and philosophical resources, as you've read in the book, that are yeah. like life is a struggle. Like right. you know, right. Kierkegaard type resources, yeah, Emil Charan resources, stuff like that. Well, okay, that's a perfect bridge to what I wanted to kind of bring up and, and maybe we'll start wade. You like what I did there? We're going to wade into uh, this kind of third and final uh, section here of, of kind of applying this stuff to how you think about God, re uh, organized religion versus sort of disorganized spirituality. Uh, maybe not disorganized, but more, more natural spirituality. Before we do that, I, I, I would like to push back gently and say, Real life is actually both. Real human life is both based on a constant competition for resources at all the way down to the fucking cellular level and up to the organism level and, you know, animals and, and, you know, we're, we're mining things out of the earth to use for our, you know, for our various usage. Like we, we are competing for resources. That's true. Uh, and that's going to intensify between human beings um, if climate change continues apace and also real human life is not that like we live in a time where if you live in anywhere basically developed, so the majority of the world actually spends most of their day, not in a struggle for resources, not right. the way that, that deer and, and coyotes are, you know, you know, whatever, like we actually mostly don't live there. That's kind of a way into talking about what you were just hinting at, which is Kierkegaard existentialism, the, the sort of messy realities of the human experience. And these do poke in, they poke in psychologically, even if we are not out uh, being with nature, red and tooth and claw, right. Staring us in the face, but we do, we deal with death that the knowledge of our impending death, we deal with the knowledge of our own finitude and this is something that comes up in the therapy room as well. So there is really this kind of balance and we have ways of kind of blocking that out and we have ways of engaging with it. One of the things that I'm really drawn to about this hunting and and like these sort of more intense outdoor uh, treks, if you will, and, and time spent is that does feel like a very natural and kind of earthbound, gr literally a grounded way of kind of exposing ourselves to and processing existential realities, especially around death and finitude. And I frankly don't have to think about that very much when I'm not in those environments. But a lot of what I want for my clients who are struggling with that is actually to be exposed to these difficult thoughts and realities. So I, I thought that was kind of an interesting point of contact. Yeah, I mean, one thing I guess I'd say is, of course, I, uh, of course, my life in general is very comfortable. It 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 lacks risk. You know, yeah. I wear a seatbelt, uh, and I'm also in a very in like a marriage that you know, you know, you know uh, that I'm in a marriage that I feel very secure in. Yeah, I feel very safe in it. I can be myself. You know, in in ways I have never felt before in any relationship. You're not constantly locking ram horns with other no. men to prove to Courtney that you are the top mate. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> Correct. But I would also say that my experience, let's say my 20s and 30s, was that all that modern safety left me cold, like deserted me, didn't do for me what I thought it was going to do, which was protect me and help me. And of course, 
a lot of that was of my own fault. Like I'm the author of my own misery in a lot of ways. And, and I try in the book to be honest about that, more honest than I've probably been in the past. But I think now, unlike our ancestors, we have to deliberately put ourselves in those situations to experience discomfort. You know, I take people canoeing. I, take, I usually take pastors into the Boundary Waters every summer to canoe. And I am say, look, you are going to be either too hot or too cold. You're, I guarantee you're gonna be, you will not be dry for a week. You're going to be wet the entire week. You're going to have bugs swarming around your head. Like this is not, this is all the stuff that in our climate controlled, bug free, you know, irradiated meat life, we don't experience. But you might, you know, you might get the runs. You might feel dehydrated. This was a big spiritual insight for me in, in this process is that I just wanted more and more connection to my ancestors. Mm. I wanted to know what it was like to be a human being when it was more of a fight for survival, when they were doing the things that led us to where we are today, which was things like figuring out how to hunt, figuring out how to use dogs to help them be better hunters, figuring out how to butcher meat safely and then cook it to kill off the parasites so that you don't, Die of dysentery. Why did you want to know that? Like, why? Why do you I don't think know. you want? Like, that's that's interesting. The, that's one of the mysteries, Dan. Is that? And even writing the book didn't answer that one for you. No, the, still... writing the book helped because okay. it helped. Uh, writing the book helped me realize that's one of the things I was looking for. I mean, I, mm. I'm not like into ancestor worship per se in some way, but but I am. Like I do want to commune with my ancestors and I felt cut off from them, from the, the people whose lives and work and, and suffering yeah. and procreation yeah. resulted in me. I wanted to like have some connection with them and in my little air conditioned home in Edina, Minnesota and like watching Netflix every night that I did not feel a connection to them in doing that. Can I throw, can I try out a theory? Please. This this has, I don't know, a 20% chance of landing. But I want to pull a few things together and see if there's something here. So you were kind of plucked for leadership to some degree from a very young age, right? And then and then the way that you became sort of famous in your world was through youth ministry, again, at a pretty young age, as far as adult ministers go. And you had a kind of a early rise. Right. And you mentioned earlier, you were talking about leadership and I actually, I jotted something down at that moment, which is that there's a different kind of leadership in organized religion versus leadership out in nature, closer to the elements in a more precarious situation, like being involved in organized religion allowed you to teach sixth graders as a ninth grader. It allowed my friend Chris to teach and mentor me as a 19 year old to an 18 year old. There is a, you know, sociologists of religion will use the sort of evolutionary language of there's a relaxed field of survival pressures in these environments. And yet you get out there onto the plains and the only leader anyone's going to trust is someone who can literally show that they know what they're doing. Not just they know how to talk good, not just they have the right phrases that will make you feel like you can trust them and that they're in your tribe, which is a big part of what goes on in uh, organized religious spaces. And I don't think that that's all bad. And, you know, I I think I use some of that in in therapy. I use that, right? I, I speak to my clients who come from various religious traditions that I know about, I use language such that they, I can communicate quickly to them. I know what you're talking about. You don't have to spend two or three sessions explaining this world to me. I'm with you. Let's keep moving. So that's not a problem, but it is a very different way of proving leadership. And I wonder if, and I'm going live here, that since you had started so young that, you know, not that you were plucked too early. I'm, I'm not making any claim like that, but like, this is like, you had to earn it. 
in a different way. And yeah. and I, you, I'm sure you did earn it in some ways, but not really as a ninth grader. No offense. Um, you probably earned it later, but like, I don't know. Is, the, is there something about, about the sort of requirements of the gig that was a part of it? Yeah, I, 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 I think you're probably right. I mean, for sure, I, I benefited in let when my first book came out in 2001, you know, when I was 30, 31 years old or something. I had grown up in this very educated family. I had read a lot of books. Then I went to an Ivy League college, you know, and then I went to seminary and was top of my class and yeah. was invited into PhD seminars when I was a master's student all because I come from this very privileged, I mean, probably I've got some, you know, I probably got a little genetic advantage on having two well-educated, smart parents who, you know, sure. I have decently smart, I think. I resonate with all of that. Like I haven't, I'm a natural leader. I'm good with yeah. language. You know, like we, we, we have some sort of natural abilities, no problem. And there's nothing wrong with using it. Uh, but I, I haven't had to show that I know how to keep people bodily safe in an, in, you know right. what I mean? I don't have but, to But I'd that. say there might be some similar, I mean, it, it's one thing to be able to be like, I can go into the world of youth ministry and kind of make a name for myself. And by the time I'm 35, I'm like one of the most famous youth pastors in the country for sure. But it's probably in the hunting arena or just any outdoors. Let's, it doesn't just have to be hunting. It can be, uh, you know, paddling in the boundary waters with no firearms. Right. right. It's probably more like a band. Like, you can't get up there and fake it that you're a league if you're a good that you're a league, good lead guitar player. Thank you so much for bringing something back in that I actually have learned to do in the but, real right? world. Right? I mean, it 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 like <laughs> no, in that's bands. True. I, mm -hmm. There's yeah, a lot of marketing similar. and spin, but still in the world of music, it seems to me it's somewhat of a meritocracy. Like you have to earn your earn your stripes. You can make it's it's why everybody makes the joke about. The whatever the 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 sophomore album, you know the sophomore like, slump. Yeah, can can bands really put out three or four or five great albums, not right. just the first, not, not just, just one great album? Mm -hmm. And I think yeah. you're right. I think it's you're right. It's the same in way more than hunting. When I take people into the boundary waters, like that's an ass puckering experience as a leader because things can go really wrong really fast, and there's very little you can do about it. In wilderness first aid, it's interesting, Dan, they teach. It's different than like if a paramedic arrives at a scene at like a house or like let's say somebody has a heart attack in the, in the city and the paramedics pull up in the ambulance and they rush in and they, they teach you in wilderness first aid. If somebody gets injured in your camp, as you're, you know, you hear somebody blowing a whistle, that means there's an emergency. As you come back, you stop on the perimeter of the scene and you and you look around and you say like I, you you you're not supposed to rush into a scene because there may be other things happening like right. there may be a storm and a tree branch is about to fall and it could crush all of you you know or it may be that there's a a, a nest full of wasps is attacking everybody the last thing that you as the leader and the one trained in first aid should do is rush in there it's the same reason you like you don't dive into the water and to save somebody who's drowning cuz they'll just pull you under so there is, it is a different, you know, yeah, I think you're right. I'll, I'll, I'll say you're hundred percent right on that. I, it, it is a different form of leadership and it's takes, what does it take from me? I don't know. More humility for sure. Um, I have to be more circumspect, I think in what I do. And just frankly, the, what the guys I spend time with in the outdoors value is very different than what the church values. They don't really care how fancy my words are and what a good public speaker I am. They're like, is he a, is he a good dude? Does he have a good dog? Is he is he safe with his gun? And does he buy a round of beers at the bar at when we go there at the end of the day? You know, like it's mm -hmm. it's pretty stripped down. Now, hunting though, especially in indigenous cultures, right, which then we can pretty safely say in more ancient human history, right? Because there's a lot of evidence that basically prehistoric sort of before pre-agrarian human societies, you know, share a lot of characteristics with each other. And in the cultures that we are aware of, 
today that we still have access to either through, you know, indigenous culture being passed down or some of these uh, hunter gatherer tribes in places like Papua New Guinea and uh, Aboriginal tribes. Hunting often has a very overtly, not only spiritual in the way that we would use it, but like religious, religious ritual associated with the hunt. And you, you mentioned in the book, there are some Christian traditions, especially in uh, the very early church that sort of take on a little bit of that. So that's kind of an interesting idea to me that you leave the organized religious space to go out into nature and encounter God there. And to some degree, you, you must be interacting with another form of sort of religious encounter of God around these activities. I'm just kind of curious about that intersection. I think another intersection that I didn't really think that much about until I was writing the book, but it's that, and, and I get a lot of this from Rene Girard, who was a French anthropologist who taught at Stanford and was very famous for his scapegoat theory and scapegoat theory, which is now a, well, that's a, that's a fun little atonement angle for the modern yeah, day. Yeah, uh, I'm a big theology. fan of Gerard. I think he was just a great writer and very thought provoking guy. And as a clergy person, I am in a long line of people from time immemorial who were clergy class people, call them priests, shamans, shamans, yeah, rit- witch doctors, call them whatever. They were. In almost every ancient culture, butchering animals for the people. Mm, like that I didn't know that. Yeah. Sacrifice. Yeah. I mean, back to the Roman heruspecs who used to, you know, cut open the, the belly of an oxen or of a goat yeah. and pull out the internal organs and look at them and tell the emperor, is this an auspicious time? It's like casting to, lots. Yeah. Yes, to go to battle or not. Tears. And it's very deeply embedded in Girard's theory that a big part of the reason human society was able to form is that religion took on the ritualistic violence that all human beings want because of mimetic desire and basically envy of each other. And Mm. so people kill each other. and, And so that's why family clans were battling family clans. But when, when a clergy class developed, they could say, you know what, uh, instead of killing each other, let's all gather around. We're going to kill a, a sheep, and we're going to watch the blood pour out, and then we're going to share the meat with the people. And then his theory is that people's bloodlust was satiated for a time, and then they'd say, okay, let's come together again next year on Yom Kippur, and we'll do it again. Like, mm. And in the meantime, don't kill each other. Like, let's live Mm -hmm. communally, and we can actually have gardens, and we can hunt and gather together. And then human society starts to form, his argument is, because of religion, because religion ritualized the bloodletting that human beings desire, okay? So I just, when I started getting blood on my hands, underneath my fingernails, I was like, oh my God, priests like me, have been doing this for a long, long time. And what do priests do now? Pour Welch's grape juice in little thimble thingies. <laughs> I mean, seriously, Dan, it yeah. couldn't be further. It's so right. sanitized. And so, mm-hmm. like, uh, it, it's like Mauna Loa Hawaiian, King's Hawaiian bread and, and Welch's grape juice. And I'm like, no, no, priests are supposed to be slaughtering animals. And like... Well, watching the blood pour there. out. There's a jump from used to to should be. I don't okay. necessarily say yeah, we should, yeah. but yeah. I'm just saying my forebears who were priests. I think that's really interesting. I mean, that's actually kind of like the thing I said at the very beginning with the cultural revolution and just kind of being put into a different time and place. I, I have a kind of a never ending thirst for uh, well put together literature, whatever, filmed content that sort of does that, that helps me get into a different mental space, a different cultural space. And so I I think there's a cool angle there for people, because one way you could think about this, my podcast in general, is ferreting out kind of the accrued shit of especially a particular Christianity, which is evangelical Protestantism, but 
other organized forms of religion and kind of separating out the wheat from the chaff, so to speak, in the sense of like one way to do that is to better understand the more primordial ways in which human beings have found religion useful, helpful, true, wise to lead to flourishing lives. Right. And so in that sense, you going back to nature and kind of mining that territory for some insight insights there is is really valuable. I want to, though, throw out a way in which a concern I have uh, with with maybe kind of the universal applicability of that, which is that it's a lot easier and and I would say probably mathematically more effective to pass down one's faith to a, a child, for instance, to your own children when there is a safe and regular environment where week after week twice a week for some people, whatever, like we can go to a place that we know is going to be lit and heated and sheltered. And, and like my son can hear the same stories week after week and he can, you know, or in psychological language, he can start associating certain things with this repeated experience. Now, of course, people hunt with their families and their children. I mean, I, and this is a world I don't know a lot about. Uh, and so I don't I don't want to cast aspersions, but it's one thing I've thought about is like, well, we take our kids hiking and tell them, isn't God's nature so beautiful or hunting or whatever? Awesome. Is that going to be as effective? Am I going to am I going to be creating the kind of experience I want to help create for my kids when it lacks that structure and regularity and organization? Th that's a tension in my mind. OK, but we, we used to have a. You know, there was there was a pretty common saying around the youth ministry world, and that is, you know, one week on a mission trip in Tijuana is ten times more powerful than the other fifty-one weeks of youth ministry that you do. But okay, but as a therapist, I disagree with that. Now, I, okay. I actually think that's wrong. But yeah, that, I understand that that would have been a talking point. That was our experience of watching kids spiritually grow, commit mm. themselves to their faith, is if okay. you can get them out of that right. regular weekly environment and you can take them somewhere that's a little scary, that's much that heightens that, that has a much more heightened experience. Sure. Yeah. Like a mission trip to Tijuana, then kids come home from that. I mean, there was this famous story back when I was a youth pastor and it was told by one of the other big youth ministry gurus at the time of they did this mission trip in Tijuana and they get back like to Santa Cruz, California, and mm -hmm. the kids are standing around the church parking lot outside the van and they're just sweaty and exhausted. And, and somebody's dad pulls up in a BMW and the kid sees his dad's BMW and he just, the kid just starts throwing up in the parking lot. It was like, it was all too much, you know, like wow. what he had just experienced in Tijuana for a yeah. week probably a little dysentery plus the dad's beamer, you know? And so I guess yeah, I would yeah. say that even, I don't think they're mutually exclusive. Sure. No, I think it's probably both. I, I yeah. bet you though, the kids that only go on the mission trip and don't have the regular youth group involvement have a different experience. The, that the could two be. together and, and for, would be the, yeah. yeah. And for me, I tell some stories in the book and I have these, I have such vivid memories of going to the Boundary Waters for the first time with my youth pastor, such a vivid memory of going to New York City and riding in the subway and having the subway stop and having a guy run through with a knife and like mm. things I never would have experienced in Edina, Minnesota, you know? Yeah. And how many youth group talks have I completely forgotten on from Wednesday nights? Sure. So Yeah. I grew up, by the way, on those specific trips because I went to church in Northern California, just over the mountains from Santa Cruz. And I went to Tijuana or once or twice we went to Mexicali, which is a little bit inland. I did that every year for yeah. five, four or five years. And then I did it a couple times in college, like as a leader. Uh, and actually those were like, those, those are problematic trips from my current perspective in terms of, I would say income, an incomplete mission experience for the sure. people that we were helping for me. They were exactly what you are talking about. They were formative. And you know what? They they did combine with my regular youth group experience. They combined with, I've talked about this before, but maybe it's been a while. They combined with punk rock and an ethic of sort of economic justice 
and care for the marginalized that I got from that music. And then I saw some of that on the trip in an imperfect way. You know, obviously we, there was some white savior complex going on, but I was 15. I I wouldn't have been capable of much better than that anyway, nor would any other 15 year old who was not on a white savior complex mission trip. So I don't blame myself for that. And I actually really value the fact that I got to see another part of the world, but I would combine it with, and I had close friends and I had actually really solid youth group leaders and I had adults in, in our church community and through my parents, friends that were like grounded and mature. And, you know, so the, the bringing it all together, I think into a package that really tracks for me as like, that's the powerful combo And so it's probably more of a both and than an either or. This may not be religious, but I think it's tied in with who we are as human beings in a a world of limited resources where you've you've already mentioned climate change. You've already mentioned that, you know, it may be that we reach some kind of a crisis over, over resources, particularly food in coming years. Maybe not while we're alive, but at some point it's Mm going to, you know, we're going to really run into that as a species. And I guess for my kids, I don't want my children who are now, you know, in their twenties, I don't want them not to know where their food comes from. Yeah. I want them to be intimately involved in the meat that's on the table. You know, uh, you and I were both at an event where I spoke and I talked about hunting to a progressive Christian audience and a couple of people got up and left because they didn't like hunting stories. They didn't go there to hear hunting stories. And swear to God, Dan, you were there. So, you know, out in the hallway were rows and rows of boxes of turkey sandwiches. You know, the, our box lunches. <laughs> I enjoyed uh, seriously. one. I enjoyed one, yeah. Right? Exactly. Do you remember? Mm-hmm. I mean, the, it, I mean, it was the, the, the number of box lunches that Kristen ordered was, it was crazy. And Mm -hmm. so they would have, you know, had had they heard another talk that morning, they would have, instead of storming out in a huff, they just would have grabbed their turkey sandwich and the saran wrap and the little pickle and the cookie, and they would have sat out on the lawn and eaten their turkey sandwich. And I maybe, maybe because of my talk, somebody there thought about that turkey and the anonymous immigrant in that turkey kill plant who slaughtered that turkey and butchered it and then another one who sliced it and another one in the back of a you know a, of a catering service making those sandwiches those people and that bird that turkey went toward our lunch that day so i just i want to be in touch with that and i want my kids to be in touch with that there are ethical issues around all of this uh, some people believe that the most ethical sort of human future is like a fully vegetarian one I'm open to those arguments. I'm not myself a vegetarian. I I love meat too much. I love the taste of it. I also love the culture around the preparation of some meat dishes, like in, in other cuisines. I find uh, enjoyment and value in that. I will say what I want to do, and, and I make some steps toward this, and I'd like to make more, is to consume meat in a more ethical fashion. And the type of, you know, hunting during hunting season, preparing that meat and eating it is, I mean, that's got to be sort of the number one option, right? This is... I, I can't imagine a better one, right. especially are, yeah. especially if you're hunting something like white-tailed deer, which because we as human beings have extirpated their natural predators, yeah. there are too many white-tailed deer, there's a lot of disease rampant in the white-tailed deer population and and in minnesota it's called the dnr and D- department of natural resources in other states is called fish and game or fish yeah. and wildlife these biologists are like we need to hunt yeah scientists to keep the, yeah. the, the, the scientists are literally yeah. telling us we need to hunt to keep the deer population healthy i got an idea for a new a new lawn sign in this home we believe in science. We hunt our own deer. Yes. <laughs> we butcher and prepare our own deer sausage. That is that going to catch on? Because they believe in I science. Mean, Dan, water uh, is if life. You print, if okay, you print can one someone up, tell I'll me where wa- my... when did water is life get added? I just <laughs> I don't like. I agree. 
I think. I'm not even Did sure they, what the what the background I, premise of Water I'm is. I'm going life tomorrow is night to, to see. I'm going tomorrow night to see Dune two, and I wonder if the Atreides family put that in front of their uh, uh, in their <laughs> stuck that sign uh, in the Arakin, sand in front of their castle. A, uh, yeah, in front of the Iraq. Ca- okay, water is life. Yeah, water is life. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, Tony, this has been really interesting, fun conversation. It's it's it was great to have an excuse to kind of just talk about the content of the book and sort of your I turn it. towards hunting. You know, we on on Generation Gap Culture Hour, we we sort of speak on wide topics, and we're and if if there's anything sort of any continuity about it, it's it's uh, talking about our age difference, you, me, and Josh, and sort of how we approach things. And so, you know, this stuff comes up a little bit, usually in, yeah. in anecdotes or whatever, but it's it's good to have an an hour and change to just dive in. So thanks for writing the book. Thanks for talking with me about it. And uh, you'll be back for listeners within a couple of weeks for another, another GGCH. Thanks. And I, I'll just, yeah, godofwildplaces.com is where you can find out a lot more about the book. And Dan, I appreciate it. And I, you know, the YHP community is great. And I look forward to the next GGCH in, a, in another couple of weeks. <laughs>